same as treatment. Um, <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> Please continue. No worries. No worries. Um, that's it's not a young treatment. It's basically very well established. One of the most um, investigated treatments of overall in medicine. It was established by um, Vincent Dole, um, Mary Newswander, and the late Mary John Creek. And um, when they published their papers in 1965. Uh, they were talking about methadone. They were saying that the simple fact is that it works. If we give it to a heroin addicted person once daily in an adequate dose, it abolishes the hunger, the narcotic hunger, without producing euphoria. And basically, no other adverse effects than constipation was found. This is something that's been uh, really confirmed in, in very many studies. So it's not a young treatment, okay? We're talking about a, an old and established treatment here. Um, in, in, in Switzerland, in the beginning of the 70s, we had a situation where um, heroin use was slowly but steadily increasing. And we did not have a treatment system in place to meet that. Um, we had basically only inpatient detoxification. We had no follow-up concepts what, whatsoever. And we had a, an increase in young um, heroin users um, and this increase kept on uh, going despite a continuous increase of treatment slots that was accompanying it, but as I said, only inpatient detox. And then in 1975, uh, uh, there was a revision of the narcotics law, which um, established licensing for doctors engaged in, in OAT. And um, they established pretty um, high threshold entry criteria for methadone treatment. You have to have um, several failed withdrawal attempts and residential treatments in order to enter out. You needed to be employed and patients needed to come to the treatment center every morning at 6.15 before work, get the, the methadone and then go to work. Um, it was basically only methadone, it's radically dehydrocodeine and, and propranifin, which was used and this was only offered to very chosen, highly privileged, very disciplined patients. Um, there were some take-home dosages, but very, very, very rare and very high thresholds. And it was clear that if you ended this treatment, you needed to have abstinence as your treatment goal. So um, the overall dose was always tapered in time. And um, so obviously this was, um, was high threshold. Uh, what was also important that from the beginning, there was a comprehensive program of psychosocial care and medical treatment accompanying it. So there were medical doctors involved, there were social workers involved, and there were also psychiatrists involved. Nevertheless, we, we saw um, uh, a development of open drug scenes, which were really appalling. Um, horrible scenes which, which made their way across the world. There was, an, even, uh, there was a, an article in the New York Times, very embarrassing for a um, neat and to clean and conservative Switzerland um, because um, there were open drug scenes developing basically in every major Swiss city. And these are pictures from, uh, from Zurich and pictures you saw from Michael Krauss already. But um, this was basically the case in all, um, all of the Swiss cities. What also happened is that the number of overdose deaths um, rose very steeply. And um, uh, you can see this here. Uh, in 1975, there were only 52 overdose deaths. And in 1991, there were 405, so an eightfold increase over 15 years. What we also saw was um, an, an, a very stark increase in newly diagnosed HIV infections. And um, Switzerland was among the hardest hit, or was the hardest hit country um, in the 1980s and 90s by HIV in Europe. And you can see here that the main driver of this epidemic uh, is the pink line that was intravenous drug, drug use. The other two drivers, homosexual and heterosexual contact, were um, of secondary importance. So we had a situation with a rising number of ODs and um, an increasing number of uh, people living with HIV and dying from HIV 
back in the days, um, which was due to in intravenous drug use. This data on the incidence and prevalence of high-risk opioid use. And um, what you can see here is that the incidence of high-risk opioid use, so the number of new high-risk opioid users occurring each year um, was rising pretty steeply up to a number of uh, uh, about 4,000 per year in a country with, um, back in the days, about six to seven million inhabitants. So um, a very, very large number. And the prevalence, so that's the overall number of high-risk opioid users, rose to about 30,000. So what now? We have this dire situation um, um, and, and, and really people dying from this. And um, what you need to know about Switzerland that is that the Swiss political system is very, very um, consensus-oriented, okay? So there's some... Um, always a government that's formed of all parties from the left to the right, and everybody has, has sent somebody and they have to kind of uh, work together to get something done. So this is pretty, pretty special and results in a lot of compromise. And it's also usually a very slow political system. But what happened here was that the pressure was um, rising pretty much, the pressure to change something was, was really rising pretty much. And it came from different parts of society and also the administration. So there were authorities on different political levels, communities, cantons, which is the, the Swiss provinces, at the federal level, um, who came together with divergent views, who never um, really uh, uh, were on the same, same page. Like I said, from the left to the right, everybody was working together, but everybody had different views. So really um, paralyzed, there was a network of different players active in the field of conflicting goals, and there was really no guide. So that's when Switzerland decided to do a national drug conference in 1991 in order to, to create a national strategy to counter drugs. And there were several, um, several cantonal provincial drug commissions also established and drug policy platform of the three major political party parties. The fourth party, which is the most uh, on the right, did not do that. And like I said, there were, was pressure from different pages, uh, different uh, parts of society. So I um, gathered some, some quotations from, from people like this guy, Jörg Schild, who was a member of the provincial government of um, Basel City, who says, uh, said back then, I am in favor of decriminalization of all drug use as I am convinced that repression of users in this form achieves nothing. So remember this is 10 years earlier from the changes that were established in, in Portugal in 2000 with the decriminalization of drugs. Same was true for law enforcement. Um, this guy who was the public prosecutor and head of narcotics department of the Basel police also said, we need a change of consciousness in every respect because I don't believe that we will get this problem off the table with repression alone. The medical authorities were also um, um, putting up pressure and we're um, advocating for the harm reduction strategy. If you're taking IV drugs, then you should be taking it the right way, which is under hygienic conditions. This is the chief medical officer of the province of, uh, of Basel. So what we had in 1991 was essentially the three pillar strategy, countering drug use, which was prevention, therapy, uh, mostly detoxification, and high threshold um, opioid agonist treatment, and law enforcement. So the big change that occurred here, and this is something that most um, Western countries have adopted now, is that the fourth pillar was introduced, and this was the harm reduction pillar. This was introduced by, um, by uh, provincial and federal policy. So what does that mean? What harm reduction measures were introduced? Um, first of all, needle exchange programs and drug consumption room safe injection facilities were established. These are actually called contact points in Switzerland because they're more than a safe injection facilities. They are a contact point where the drug user can get into contact with the treatment system, low threshold, okay? So there's, you don't have to come into, into contact, but there is doctors dropping by every now and then. There is um, counselors, working there, so there's always a link to the treatment system, which is offered. No force there, just offered. 
Um, other low threshold offers comprise social support, shelters, free meals, day structuring activities, supported employment, even on an hourly basis. So there's places where you can just go without um, for prior notice and work for two or three hours, get a couple of bucks and then leave again. No, uh, really, no, uh, how do you say? There's no, you don't have to be there. You can just, it's, it's voluntary and you can, you can be there or not. But there was also tailored reintegration, supported employment on a higher level to, to reintegrate people into the workforce. And last of all, but probably most important, was access to methadone treatment on less restrictive conditions than, than before for all heroin dependent persons seeking treatment. And back then, basically, all opioid dependent patients were, were heroin dependent. So, low threshold oath with uh, methadone was established. And um, this is the point uh, where I try to be interactive with you guys. Um, now, oh, opa, go back. Uh, do you see this? Um, a question? Can you see it? Yes? All right. So there's a code on top here. And if you go to menti.com with your smartphone or computer and you enter the code, you can answer the questions. And I want to know from you guys, what do you think are the most important barriers to entering opioid agonist treatment? And I put up a couple of them, which um, may be important. I'm sorry, we can't see any code. Ah. Why don't we type it in the chat? Uh, that's bad. How do we do this? Yes. Um, go to menti.com and I'll type in the number. How do we do this? How do we do this? Stop. Okay. Chat. So this is the number you need to type in, and this is the website you need to go to. Does it work? I'm so excited. Yes. Something's happening. You can enter um, more than one answer, right? All right, so that's pretty good. Do you see the answers now? Yes? All right. So I'm sorry that there's a, it's still, um, you know, still getting used to this after one and a half years of the pandemic, but uh, it's working. So what are the most important barriers? Um, we'll, we'll have to look at this. Most of you seem to choose having to attend all appointments. It's, um, it's very important. Number two is the stigma of vote, 22%. Uh, third rank is aim of a drug-free state. Fourth with 11% is not being able to choose the opioid agonist which is prescribed. Then we have supervised dosing and urinalysis on uh, the next spot and the last one. There's no high for methadone and buprenorphine. So you, can, you can't get high from that. So is that a bad thing? Bad thing. So we'll see. I'll talk about this in a sec. So now I need to go back to my other presentation. You see it again, Melissa? Yes. The presentation? All yeah. Right. So what does low threshold oat mean? It, first of all, it means that opioid dependence is the only precondition that patients need to meet. So you're opioid dependent, you can enter oat. 
doesn't matter what the age you you have. It doesn't matter um, uh, whether you use prescription opioids, whether you use heroin. Opioid dependence is the only precondition. It's covered by health insurance. Health insurance is mandatory in Switzerland. If you can't pay for it, social welfare will pay for it. So it will. It's covered. Okay, the treatment is always covered. The patient is involved in all decisions. He can determine the optimal medication and dose. So the patient can actually choose his medication in Switzerland, which was in 1991, there was only methadone, so not much to choose, but you'll see later. And um, now we have a, a very different um, distribution of, of substances. And dose and medication are determined clinically and always individually. Ongoing substance use is not sanctioned. So if, you, if the patients use um, opioids or the patients use benzodiazepines, they, they're not, the old is not stopped or anything, okay? Long-term treatment is possible. There's no termination date. It's a chronic condition with an open-ended open um, treatment. There were no mandatory dose reductions anymore. Abstinence is not the treatment goal anymore. Okay, so well, the treatment goal changed from, from abstinence to, uh, to, uh, to a basically a life with um, high quality and self-determined. Coverage um, was comprehensive and um, it's, this treatment form is basically available everywhere in Switzerland. It's available in specialized institutions, but also in private practices. It's continued in case of hospitalization, in case of detention or imprisonment, and there's take home for the large majority of patients and shortly or immediately with treatment initiation. So very, very quickly. And what you need to know, there's no difference for take home for between methadone, buprenorphine, or slow release morphine. They're all handled the same concerning take home. So there's no um, advantage here for the prenofin. What are the main barriers from the perspective of opioid users? And you see that um, what, what, what you said is pretty much the same. Um, having the dose supervised every day was mentioned by a third of all patients as one of the conditions of treatment entry that were hardest to meet, but also as um, uh, remaining in treatment had the most impact on daily life. So having those supervised every day, which is obviously no, just the case for very few patients now, um, was considered a large barrier. Having to attend all appointments was considered a large barrier. And having to completely stop all illegal drug, drug use, which is also not the case anymore. Okay, so this is um, something, something that the patients state, but which is not the case anymore. And no threshold out. Um, I know I told you that the, the oat is available everywhere in Switzerland, and you know Switzerland is um, it's not very large, but it's got a lot of mountains, and uh, sometimes um, you need to drive for a long time to get through the mountains to get somewhere. So the GPs play a big, big role, and this is actually our main pillar. You know, sixty percent of treatments are done by GPs. The remaining 40% are patients that are treated in special outpatient uh, institutions, and um, only very few are treated in residential settings. And almost half of all GPs registered in Switzerland offer OAT, and this is a problem we're now facing. Um, a lot of GPs are um, facing retirement, and a lot of the younger GPs did not live through um, the open drug scenes and did not really learn about that during their their education. So we sort of have a, we need to um, educate the young GPs about this treatment. It's one of the, the challenges we're facing right now. Okay. What we also do is opioid agonist treatment is, is really a term I don't like. I prefer opioid assisted treatment because the opioid we prescribe is basically just, it's just part of our treatment. Um, there's differences here between GPs and institutions. GPs often mainly provide um, the opioid agonist and the, um, the somatic medical treatment, um, treatment of medical com comorbidities. 
but it's the institutions that usually involve addiction psychiatrists and um, also specialized internal um, medicine um, doctors. And the treatment of psychiatric comorbidities is something which is very important. And it's often underdiagnosed with our patients, but it affects more than 80%. And these are the patients that typically um, flock to the institutions, um, which is good because there's addiction psychiatrists in the institutions who can take care of both the addiction and the comorbidity. And also, what, what is the, the assisted um, comprise also? It's psychosocial support. And living conditions are, are looked at work, so their support of employment and support in finding work in, uh, in treatment. And there's psychotherapy available to um, every patient that needs it. And often we have to say it's the opioid agonist treatment, which um, is very necessary um, for people in order to come to stabilize that much that they can enter psychotherapy and, and uh, get treatment for, for their psychiatric comorbidities. So what happened to the number of um, opioid agonist treatment in this scheme, and what you can see here is that from 1991 on, there was a large increase um, in, in, in the number of treatments. And this, these are old data, but we now have about 20,000 patients, 21,000 patients in opioid agonist treatment. But what also became clear pretty quickly is that oral opioid agonist treatment did not reach all patients. So we had a low threshold treatment uh, in place, but we continually saw a clinically re relevant portion of opioid dependent patients that were not responding from adequately to adequately perform methadone treatment. And what became clear is that there's about 20% of patients that need a mode of application in the rapid onset of effect. And this was the, the realization that Michael Krauss talked about when that heroin um, assisted treatment was, um, was a good idea. Um, Switzerland was not the first to do this. Um, the first um, guys doing this were, were um, was Dr. Marx from, from Liverpool in England. But um, the Swiss were the first to establish a treatment system um, with specialized institutions offering um, heroin assisted treatment on site. So, um, what became clear is that there is this proportion of people, about 20%, with opioid use disorders, which, are, which do not respond, which continue risky behaviors, which continue substance use and uh, criminal behavior and suffer from negative health consequences. So, what was done? in 1994 was that a national cohort study called PROVE was established. And this study, um, the, 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 the injectable heroin treatment was established accompanied by, by this study. And this is, I think, one of the great achievements um, we had back then is that um, we were establishing a new treatment option and at the same time, we were scientifically accompanying it and scientifically evaluating it. And what the, this, the study had as an aim uh, to look at safety of patients and staff, um, which was guaranteed, which was good. They looked at retention and treatment, which was very high and um, higher than with methadone. Um, and we have to keep in mind, this treatment was only offered to patients who did not respond to methadone. So one of the entry criteria for heroin assisted treatment is that you have to fail two conventional treatments. So either detoxification or um, oh, with methadone, buprenorphine or slow release morphine. So these people are allowed to enter HAP. And for these patients, these selected patients, which, which are the non-responders to conventional treatment, we found a higher retention and treatment than we normally do for, for old. Um, the use of non-prescribed substances was reduced. Psychological and physical health were improved. Homelessness was reduced. The employment rates increased. And there was probably most um, impressive of all a stunning reduction of criminal behavior. This has been called the single most effective measure to reduce crime in Swiss history. And this is also what makes it cost-effective. It's a cost-effective treatment. 
for every dollar, every Swiss uh, franc that we in, invest, we uh, get a return of about 50 Swiss francs. The problem here is that we save money in the justice sector, but we spend it in the medical sector. So it's always um, difficult to, to, um, to weigh this because the, the, the costs occur in a different uh, sector than the savings. The results of this study, which has a, had its um, uh, methodological flaws, was uh, replicated by much better studies than done in Germany, in the Netherlands, in the UK, in Canada, and in Belgium. And dice 2 morphine, which is pharmaceutical heroin, has been registered as a medication um, since then. Its coverage is also um, guaranteed by, by health insurance. And you know, the Swiss um, have a system of direct uh, democracy. So we um, vote on many, many uh, topics. Um, and there were several popular votes that were accepting this treatment until it was also legally implemented into the law in 2008. So despite being a very conservative uh, country, um, Switzerland reacted very pragmatic um, back in the 1990s and uh, the popular votes accepted this treatment form. I want to show you this slide. Um, it looks uh, more complicated than it is. It's data from, uh, from a systematic review done by um, Peter Strang and colleagues. It compares supervised injectable heroin um, with, uh, with uh, supplemental flexible doses of oral methadone versus um, flexible oral methadone alone. What you can see here is um, on the right hand side is that the su supervised injectable heroin is favored concerning treatment retention. It's slightly better or it's better. And there's a tendency also for a lower mortality in supervised injectable heroin treatment. Um, I already told you about the entry criteria for HUT. Um, so this is probably interesting for you to see. Those are the centers, the specialized institutions offering OAT, and all the black or half black dots are the ones that offer heroin assisted treatment. Is there a question? No. Um, we now have there's two treatment centers that opened up since the map was drawn. We now have 24 treatment centers for heroin assisted treatment in Switzerland. So um, this is also available um, very much across the country. And uh, most of these treatment centers have been open since 1994. What we saw now in, in recent years is that intravenous um, uh, injectable O doesn't reach all patients either. Um, so this is why we're now, what we now started um, a few years ago is that we also offer nasal dice 2 morphine. I'm not going into the details here too much because if you want to hear about this, you can um, register for my other workshop later on. Um, we, we have a certain pa a group of patients um, which are aging in Switzerland. So um, these often have um, uh, a deteriorated uh, bean status. They cannot inject into the peripheral beans anymore. So some revert to um, muscle injection and others revert to the, the groin injection, which are both um, also dangerous and um, not very nice to do. So, um, and we also have a, a large population, growing population suffering from COPD, which is a chronic lung disease due to um, their tobacco use. And for these patients, the injection is either no longer possible or simply dangerous. And we also have a, a group that only snorts opioids. And for these patients, um, we didn't really have a treatment options. We offered them um, heroin tablets, that is two morphine tablets, which worked fine for some, but also heroin tablets do not have the same rapid onset of effect. And as you remember, we told, were saying that there were about 20% who need a rapid onset of effect. So um, the tablets don't provide that. So what we did now is that we use this atomizer, which is usually used to apply naloxone in emergency situations. Now we use it to apply 
um, pharmaceutical heroin in our treatment centers. And um, the results are quite encouraging, I have to say. Okay, I wanna, I wanna talk a little bit about opioid agonists, use for, for opioid agonist treatment. Um, you were already hearing some of this uh, from, from Mrs. Uh, Giraudon. Um, this is data from across Europe and which agonists are used. And uh, what you can see here in red is methadone and blue is buprenorphine. Um, in turquoise is slow release oral morphine and the green is um, pharmaceutical heroin. And what you can see is that it's basically very, very different from country to country. So obviously um, this is not a rational and evidence-based choice, but this is depending on other things. For example, legislation, making it easier or, uh, or more difficult to prescribe certain medication. It's, uh, it depends on the preference of, uh, of doctors mainly, um, and sometimes probably just on, uh, on, uh, on uh, coincidence, but it's not driven by evidence. And you can also look at Canada. Canada would probably um, fit somewhere in the middle with the largest part um, of buprenorphine well, offered. Um, however, when you have a situation where there is different medication available, including pharmaceutical heroin, which you can see here in red, and slow release oral morphine, which you can see in green, but also, of course, buprenorphine in blue and methadone in gray, this is a situation you get when the patient chooses the medication and different medication is available. This data from, uh, from Zurich. And what you can see here is that in the beginning of the 90s, um, there was only methadone available. And the proportion of methadone has been declining since then. Um, it was in 1994, pharmaceutical heroin established. And you can see that it's quickly um, gathered speed there, but stayed and plateaued at about 12% of patients in old. So about 12% of our patients choose heroin-assisted treatment. Um, buprenorphine was established a little bit later. It was approved a little bit later in 2002 in Switzerland. And you can see also that it plateaus somewhere around 12%. And slow release morphine was established in 2013. And um, it's been uh, rising since then up to a proportion of about 30, 33% until now. So what you can see is that if patients choose their medication, only very few or only 12% choose buprenorphine. This is an important point of why we do not have an opioid uh, overdose crisis. And I think um, part of the problem why Canada does have an opioid crisis is the fixation on buprenorphine. Is there, so I have a question in the chat. Um, so the question is, are there any exchange programs for physicians in Switzerland for Canadian physicians to learn more about rehabilitation programs? Yeah, I'll probably um, put this, I'll answer that in the, in the end because it doesn't fit with um, the topic right now. I'll, I'll answer it, it um, in the end. Um, so are there differences on, on patients on different opioids? Yes, there are. Buprenorphin well, patients in Switzerland are younger than methadone patients. They're more often male and they have a higher social integration. Um, I'm not sure whether this is a consequence of buprenorphine and its special, um, um, special effects that it has, or if this is a consequence of us physicians prescribing buprenorphine to this population. I think it's rather the latter. Slow release morphine, uh, these patients are also younger than methadone patients are more often male. And um, the patients on pharmaceutical heroin, on morphine, they're the most homogenous group compared to other opioids. They're older, they have more injection experience, and they have lower social integration, which is obviously due to the entry criteria where, um, where they, they have. And we've heard about old coverage already. Um, uh, Switzerland has an old coverage between 70 and 80 percent. So on any given day, 70 to 80 percent of patients, of opioid dependent patients, are an old. So this is um, pretty good. 
And uh, let's take a look at this with ODs, OD deaths. How, how did that develop after the introduction of low threshold methadone treatment, heroin assisted treatment? And what you can see is that these numbers decline pretty much, they're plateauing. Um, the, the recent numbers in the last two, three years um, are around the, the same as in 2018. So you can see a steady decline. And the same is true for the number of HIV infections. Um, intravenous drug use does not play a role in HIV infections anymore. And it, uh, it hasn't for years now. In 17 years as an addiction psychiatrist, I have only diagnosed one person with HIV, newly diagnosed. So very, very, very few. Um, the problem that we're rather facing is that our um, opioid dependent population is aging. And what you see here is the age distribution of patients in heroin assisted treatment. And the dark, the black um, bar is the, the year 2001 and the light gray bar year 2010 and the, the dark gray bar it's the year 2019. And what you can see is that in 2001 and 2010, there were still patients between the age of 20 and 24 in treatment. This is not the case anymore in 2019. So the youngest patients are above 25 years of age. And while there were no patients at all um, over the age of 55 or in, in 2001, um, we now have about 16 to 18 percent above the age of 55. We even have people aged above 70 now. Um, the largest age group now, and this moves pretty much to the right with the years, is now 50 to 54 years old. And in 2019, we had a mean mean age of 48.6 years. So this is an aging population. And given that many of these patients age prematurely due to the, the consequences of street drug use and, and, and chronic infections. Um, they, they also developed um, age-associated diseases earlier, and uh, this is really a geriatric population we're treating here. It's a population that's suitable for age medicine. So let's go back to now. Um, is Switzerland facing another epidemic too? I know these are um, uh, Swiss Journal articles I know you can't, um, most of you will not be able to understand that. What they basically say is that um, uh, pain, uh, pain medication, opioid use in Switzerland has risen uh, 23 fold in 30 years. Uh, the monster in the tablet or in the, in the uh, vial and doctors um, uh, prescribe more and more strong painkillers. And actually, um, Switzerland is number seven. And if you can count, there's only six countries here, but um, it's number seven in per capita opioid usage in the world. And um, we saw the data from Michael Krauss um, already. We're up there with uh, uh, Canada, America, Germany, Austria, and Australia. But you can also see that um, Canada and, and the US have, still have rates of much higher than we do. So let's take a look. Are we facing a new um, opioid epidemic? And the quick answer is no, we don't. Um, we, we really um, saw a steep decline in high-risk opioid use after the introduction of the harm reduction measure, measures in 1991. And we're also seeing a decline of uh, the prevalence of high-risk opioid use. So no, not at the moment. Why is that so? Um, there's probably um, several factors. Um, one of it is that the opioid availability on a broader basis has, has not been as, um, as expanded as it was in the whole of North America. So we have less population that was opioid exposed. Um, we didn't have a more or less sudden reduction in prescription opioid supply like um, you guys in North America had. And consequentially, we did not have any fentanyl entering our market yet. And 
most important of all, I think we have a functioning low threshold treatment system for opioid addiction. Um, a word for, to COVID-19, um, how did COVID-19 affect our treatment system? It actually, was, um, it wasn't bad for us because it allowed us to, to use the COVID-19 pandemic as um, an opportunity to establish um, even lower threshold treatment measures and find pragmatic solutions for our patients who are actually high risk patients concerning COVID-19. So we had longer take homes that were already there for up to a month, but now we have the, the month take homes for um, a larger number of patients than before. We established take homes even for liquid injectable diastumofine, which worked fine. And we were also able to establish online consultations. So um, we're now looking to um, keep those changes um, to, to, um, to the treatment system and kind of when the COVID epidemic stops, we want to, um, want to keep those, those relaxations of rules. So what did I tell you about today? Um, I was telling you about the four element strategy incorporating harm reduction, which was crucial for success and progress in Switzerland and which was politically supported across the political spectrum. I was telling you that communication collaboration between stakeholders on different levels was very important. I did not tell you about the involvement of people who use drugs, but they were involved right there. I was telling you that scientific evidence was established alongside um, uh, the, the changes in, in treatment policy and served as guidance for, for drug policy. And I was telling you about low threshold and patient-centered oath, with, which was easily accessible with few restrictions, no regulatory differences between substances such as bupromethine, methadone, or slow release morphine. I was telling you about heroin assisted treatment and other diversified agonist options. I was telling you about individualized treatment, about costs covered by health insurance, and um, about the interdisciplinary approach we use in our old institutions with uh, psychiatric and psychosocial support, which is important for the comorbid conditions. And with that, I'm finished, and uh, you already saw this is the Platz Spitz in Zurich, the open drug scene in 1990. And this is what it looked like in 2008. All right, thank you.